Looking for magic cards? At flipsidegaming.com you can now use the promo code LVD to get a 10% discount on orders over $10 while supporting the channel at the same time. Hello and welcome to another Magic Arena gameplay video. Today we're taking a look at the Forest Smite starter deck. First off we'll take a look at the deck list and play a game with the deck without making any changes to it out of the box. And then afterwards I'll show you how I would personally gradually upgrade the deck list. And then we'll also play some games with the fully upgraded deck to get a better feel for it. So first off let's take a look at the deck list. So Forest Smite is a mono green creature deck that tries to ramp into some big creatures and back them up with removal spells like Rabbit Bite and pump spells like Titanic Growth. So taking a look at the entire list, at one mana we've got two copies of Lanor Elves to help us ramp, we have two copies of Druid of the Cowl to do the same, then at two mana we also have a Greenwood Sentinel as a two mana 2-2 two -two with Vigilance and Highland Game a 2-1 that gains two life when it dies. Then we've got two Plummets main deck to destroy Flyers, which is a bit of a weird addition to the main deck, but I guess some of the other starter decks have some powerful Flyers we need to deal with. We've got Rabbit Bite as removal, Titanic Growth as a powerful pump spell. We also have a Verdant Rebirth, which is kind of a strange addition, but I guess it's there. We've got two copies of Blanchwood Armor, which can be very powerful in this mono green deck where our mana base is all forests. We've got some Centaur Coursers, just three mana 3-3s. Three and two Elvish Rejuvenators to help us ramp as well. Then going further down the list here, at four mana we've got three Bristling Boars, which is a 4-3 that can only be blocked by one creature. We've got one Gigantosaurus at five mana, which is a 10-10, so very difficult to deal with for some decks. We've got two Vigilant Baloths, 5-5 five five with Vigilance for five mana. We've got an Aggressive Mammoth at six mana, 8-8 eight eight Trample that gives other creatures Trample as well. And we've got a Prodigious Growth, which is a 6 mana aura that enchants one of our creatures, giving it plus 7, plus 7, and trample. And then topping off our curve, we've got a Meteor Golem, 7 mana 3-3, three, three, that can destroy any non-land permanent and opponent controls when it enters the battlefield. And a Galta Primal Hunger, which is also one of the standout cards in the deck, can potentially only cost double green for a 12-12 creature with trample. And of course the cost is reduced by the total power of creatures we control, so the more creatures we have in play, the better and the cheaper Galta becomes. And then we've got 25 a basic forests, no rare dual lands required here. Alright, so let's uh, jump into a game with a Forest Smite without making any changes to it, and then we'll be back to upgrade the deck. Alright, we're on the play, and our opening hand's kind of strange since we've got the Lanor Elves, but we don't have any other creatures to really ramp into. That being said, it's difficult to turn down an opening hand with the turn 1 Lanor Elves in this deck when we only have the two copies, and just hope to draw into a creature to turn on Rabbit Bite and Titanic Growth. So turn one elves. Up against the blue deck. No turn one play it looks like. Or oh, never mind. Gearsmith Prodigy. So your opponent could be on the blue white starter deck here. And we did pick up a Highland game. So we can play that for now. So the Prodigy can get plus one plus so as long as they control an artifact. Instead the turn two play was just a Relic Runner. Alright, so I don't mind attacking with the Highland game here. See what our opponent does about it. Opponent blocks with the Relic Runner. I think I'm okay using Titanic Growth here. And the main reason is that we've got the Growth in hand, so if we don't draw any more creatures and we need the Highland game to enchant here. So I think I'm just gonna say go. Keep Rabbit Bind until after maybe we play the growth to take out a larger, scarier creature than uh, the Prodigy here. Opponent with a Sky Scanner, making Prodigy into a 2 2 creature and drawing them a card. So that was a pretty good one here. So we'll take two. Alright, Courser was a good draw. I think I'm gonna attack for two if they want to trade for Sky Scanner, that's fine by me. I uh, don't really want to attack with the Lanor Elves since we kind of want the mana to get up to six. Opponent takes it. Let's play a Centaur. Not really interested in using the Rabbit Bite quite yet. Another Prodigy. Into another Relic Runner. And Sky Scanner gets in for one. 
don't really want to tank with the center courser, otherwise your opponent can just double block with the prodigies and we would only kill one of them. Of course, your opponent could respect the second Titanic growth, and in that case, we might get in for three. But I think I'm gonna play it safe for now, just keep Courser back, but I'm fine trading the Highland game for any of the opponent's creatures here. Opponent accepts the trade. We gain two, and we'll play a Bristling Boar, which can attack into the double Prodigy, thanks to its ability. And then if we draw land, we can slam the growth here. Otherwise, we might do something else. Opponent with a pretty good one here. One with a machine, drawing them three cards for four mana. That's not a bad rate. Opponent just says go, and we picked up a, a Blanchwood armor. So I think we're enchanting the Courser so that it can attack past uh, Gearsmith as well, making it into a 7-7. And uh, then we can also tank with a boar. And again, we could use a rabbit bite, but I don't really see a reason to quite yet, since these creatures aren't too scary. So let's just attack with these two. And then our opponent might use a removal spell on the center courser, but then we can just growth the boar and hopefully kill the opponent before they find a second removal spell. Right, looks like just a chum block with a scanner, that's fine. So now the prodigies are back to being 1-2 creatures. And it's going to be an Azor, the Lawbringer. That's definitely a creature worth killing, but we will be unable to because of its ability. Alright, so here it's unlikely that our opponent trades off Azor for the center courser, so I'm still fine attacking with it, even though we've got the plummet in hand to answer Azor. Uh, so this seems fine. So I'm expecting a chum block here. Yep. And now the first opportunity we get, we can plummet uh, Azor before our opponent draws any cards with it. So Azor down. Could have also put a stop on the opponent's upkeep and then use a plummet before they got a draw step in case they've got some counter spells in their deck, but I don't think they do. All right, it's just going to be a field creeper into ether shield artificer. That's fine. So we're still missing the land for the growth, but that's okay. So probably just going to play a bailoth here, and our opponent's just going to concede here. Yeah, we were going to be able to attack with the Courser and the Boar. They could trade Artificer for Boar, that's fine. We add a 5-5 five, five to the board, and then we still have Rabbit Bite to answer a creature, and if we draw land, we can play the Growth and uh, take over the game from there. All right, now it's time to make some upgrades to the deck. So in the game we just played, we got to see some of the strengths of the Monogreen archetype in action. We got to see Lanor Elves accelerate our mana. We got to see creatures like a Centaur Courser and Bristling Boar on average being larger than creatures in different colors. So that's one of the advantages that green gets, is that your creatures on average are going to be larger than in other colors. And we also got to see the strength of Blanchwood Armor pumping our creatures and rewarding us for staying in the mono green. So those are usually the strengths of the mono green deck. You get access to mana acceleration, you get access to larger creatures, so you're faster to get on the board and try to overpower your opponent that way. So now it's time to upgrade the deck, and there's some pretty good news here, because in some of the other starter decks, the multicolor starter decks, we get access to some pretty powerful rares that we can add to the mono green deck right away if we've unlocked those starter decks without having to invest any wild cards. And those cards include one copy of Thorn Lieutenant in the Auras of Majesty green-white starter deck. And that's a very exciting addition since it's going to be in the final build of the deck as well. Two mana for a 2-3 Elf Warrior. Whenever Thorn Lieutenant becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, we can make a 1-1 Elf token. So when the opponent tries to kill it, we still get a 1-1 token out of the deal. And then later in the game when we have access to 6 mana, Thorn Lieutenant can get plus 4 plus 4 on turn of turn at instant speed. So kind of a built-in pump spell. So Thorn Lieutenant is definitely a nice addition for the deck. At some point we'll even add a second copy to the deck and use a wild card on it. Then another powerful rare we can add out of the Jungle Secrets blue-green Merfolk deck is one copy of Jade Light Ranger, 3 mana for a 2-1 that explores twice when it enters the battlefield. So it either draws us a bunch more lands, which is helpful when casting our more expensive creatures, or it becomes a 4-3 creature giving us a bit of card selection, which is always nice. 
So that's also a rare we can add to the deck without having to spend any wild cards on it. Jade Light Ranger will just be a placeholder, it's not going to be in the final build of the deck, but it's still a temporary upgrade over some of the other cards in the deck. And then in the Primal Fury Red Green Dinosaur Starter deck, we get access to one copy of Gorklaw, Terror of Calcisma, 4 mana for a 4 3 legendary creature that says a creature spells we cast with power 4 or greater costs 2 generic mana less to cast, so it gives us a nice discount on our powerful creatures. And whenever Gorklaw attacks, creatures we control with power 4 or greater get plus 1 plus 1 and trample until end of turn, so this is also a nice addition to the deck. And then last but certainly not least, we get access to one copy of Carnage Tyrant, 6 mana, 7 6. Trample Hexproof that cannot be countered, so this one is also present in the Primal Fury starter deck and a pretty nice mythic that we can add to the deck right away and can potentially remain in the final build of the deck or potentially move to the sideboard of the final build according to how you want to build the deck and how good you want to be against control decks. So those are some nice upgrades we can add to the deck right away without having to spend any wild cards. So now we can also make some cuts to the deck right away. So Plummet is a reasonable card, but a card I would much rather have in the sideboard since it could be a dead card in multiple matchups in game 1 situations if the opponent doesn't have any flying creatures. So Plummet will probably add to the sideboard, but we can cut from the main deck for now. Then another card I'm not a fan of is Verdant Rebirth, can easily cut that one as well. And since we've added a pretty good 2-drop in the form of Thorn Lieutenant, we can cut a pretty weak 2-drop in the form of Highland Game. And then another easy upgrade we can make is to add more copies of Lanor Elves, and in the red-green Primal Fury starter deck we also get access to some copies of Lanor Elves, so we can easily go up to 4 copies of Lanor Elves without having to use any wild cards. And by adding some Lanor Elves, I don't mind cutting a forest out of the deck, go back to 24, which is more reasonable with all the mana acceleration we have, and then we can also cut an additional copy of Highland Game to go back to 60 cards. Alright, so now it's time to bust out the wild cards to continue upgrading the deck. So first off I'll go over all the uncommons I would add to the deck in order of importance, and then I'll do the same for rares and then mythics as well. So first off, let's go over some of the powerful uncommons we can add to the deck, and one of the first ones I would suggest adding includes Crawl Harpooner, 2 mana for a 3-2, creature with a reach, and it also has undergrowth, which says when Crawl Harpooner enters a battlefield, choose up to one target creature with flying you don't control, and then Crawl Harpooner gets plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard, and then you can have Crawl Harpooner fight that creature. So Crawl Harpooner can kind of be used as a removal spell for opposing flying creatures, which is kind of nice, especially with the fact that we removed the plummets out of the main deck, so this still gives us access to a bit of interaction against flying creatures, which is nice. And then just being a 2 mana 3 2 is quite powerful. And then also something to point out is that Carl Harpooner synergizes quite nicely with uh, our 12 mana Galta. Because uh, when Carl Harpooner enters the battlefield, let's say we've got three creatures in our graveyard by the time we cast Carl Harpooner, then Carl Harpooner will get plus 3 plus 0 in addition. So 6 power creature for 2 mana, which gives a total discount of 6 mana for Galta. So that can lead to a Galta out of nowhere when the opponent doesn't expect it. You can just go Carl Harpooner into Galta on the cheap, which is uh, pretty nice. And then we can cut some of the weaker 2 drops for them. So Highland Game can go all together. Greenwood Sentinel can go, and then we could also cut one copy of Druid of the Cal, for example, to go back to 60. Then the next uncommon I would suggest adding to the deck is a few copies of a Vinemare. So 4 mana for a 5-3 creature with Hexproof, and a Vinemare can be blocked by black creatures, so Vinemare is a great target for enchantments like Blanchwood Armor, and is also a great target for the 6 mana Prodigious Growth, and also makes for a nice target when you're trying to kill something with a rabbit bite, for example. So two copies of Vinemare is probably where I want to be. And of course Vinemare also synergizes nicely with Goreclaw that we just added, being another high power creature that gets the discount. And then the next uncommon I would add is four copies of Thrashing Brontodon, three mana for a 3-4. For one mana we can sacrifice a Brontodon to destroy target artifact or enchantment, so it gives us a bit of interaction, but three mana for a 3-4 is not a bad deal. So we can add four Brontodons, which is a strict upgrade over Central Courser, since we're mono green, so the double green in the convert mana cost doesn't really matter. And in the meantime, we could also cut some copies of Brissing Boar, even though it has some neat synergies with cards like Goreclaw, but we've added some better four drops in the meantime. And I also don't mind cutting the Meteor Golem at seven mana, it's pretty pricey. And then the final uncommon I would add to the deck includes two copies of Merfolk Branchwalker to round out the two drops. 
So we'll add two of those as well, and then cut the final copy of Adrudo the Cow, and we can also cut one Elvish Rejuvenator, for example. All right, so we're back to 60 cards. We've improved the deck by just adding some uncommons to the deck. Now it's time to add some powerful rares to the deck as well. The first rare I recommend adding is four copies of Steel Leaf Champion, triple green for a 5-4. Steel Leaf Champion can be blocked by creatures with power two or less. So just a huge creature you can drop on turn two potentially if you can lead with a turn one lateral elves. So we will add four copies of Steel Leaf Champion as our first rare just because it adds so much power and toughness to the board for so little mana investment and every time you have it in your opening hand it's going to have a very big impact on the game so now we can cut some of our mopier three drops so our jade light ranger can now go rejuvenator can go as well and the services of bristling boar are no longer required and now we can probably also cut a titanic growth out of the deck since one thing we're starting to notice is that all the creatures we're adding to the deck are a lot larger than the creatures we're taking out so we don't need the effect from titanic growth as much one thing we also noticed in the game we played earlier is that sometimes you'll have these draws with rabbit bites and titanic growths and if the opponent manages to deal with one of the few creatures you have then these cards are going to be stranded in your hand so you don't want to rely on them too much and you would rather just have more large creatures that you can play instead so after adding our Steel Leaf Champions, the next rare I would suggest adding is more copies of Galta Primal Hunger, since Galta tends to end games where you can play her in time. So we can go up to three copies of Galta, she is still legendary, so going up to four has some diminishing returns as well, but three copies of Galta seems like a good number. And now that we've added Galta, we don't need some of the other large creatures that are in the deck that are more expensive. Uh, the effect from Prodigy's Growth is not as necessary, so that can go. And then we can probably cut one Vigilant Baloth as well to go back down to 60 cards. So now we've added two different rares to the deck using wild cards. And then the next rare we want to add to the deck is four copies of Pelt Collector. One mana for a 1-1 Elf Warrior. Whenever another creature we control enters the battlefield or dies, if that creature's power is greater than Pelt Collector's, put a plus one plus one counter on Pelt Collector. And as long as Belt Collector has three or more plus one plus one counters on it, it also has Trample. So just a very nice cheap play we can make that will grow along with the other creatures we play. So it's a very low mana investment, but it can end up being a 4-4, four, four, a 5-5, five, five, even greater. So just a very nice turn one play for the deck alongside the four copies of Lenor Elves as well. So we'll add four copies of Belt Collector. And by adding Pelt Collector, our auras like our Blanchwood Armor are less necessary as well, and they're also kind of a nombo with our Pelt Collector, since uh, Pelt Collector just wants us to play more creatures, and Blanchwood Armor will not help us pump the Pelt Collector, so the armor can go. And the two remaining copies of Titanic Growth can go as well, since they also don't really synergize with Pelt Collector all that well. And now it's time to add some powerful Mythics to the deck, and Nullhide Ferox is the perfect fit. Four mana for a 6-6 six, six creature with Hexproof that says you can't cast non-creature spells, and any player can pay two mana for Nullhide Ferox to lose all abilities until end of turn, which of course includes both Hexproof and the ability to not be able to cast non-creature spells. So the opponent's going to use it so they can get rid of Hexproof and target the Nullhide Ferox. We're going to pay the two in case we want to cast some non-creature spells, but as we see in a second here, that's not really going to come up a whole lot, since we're going to remove all the non-creature spells from our deck. And then last but not least, if a spell or ability an opponent controls causes us to discard Nullhide Ferox, put it on the battlefield instead of putting it in the graveyard. So if your opponent is playing Thought Erasure and Nullhide Ferox is the last card in your hand, they have to make you discard it and you'll get to put it in play instead. If your opponent is playing the 4 mana Nicol Bolas and makes you discard, you can put it in play. If your opponent's playing Disinformation Campaign, you can discard it and put it in play. So it does have some uh, interesting applications in Standard. So we will add 4 copies of Nullhide Ferox to the deck which also adds a nice 6 power creature to help us grow our Pelt Collector when it enters the battlefield or dies, and also helps out a lot when uh, playing Galta, since it adds a 6 power creature to the board that the opponent won't be easily getting rid of. So by adding Nullhide Ferox, it makes sense to cut all the non-creature spells out of the deck, so now the remaining copies of Rabbit Bite can go, and the last copy of Vigilant Baloth can go as well. So that brings us back to 60 cards once again. And with the addition of Nullhide Ferox, we've kind of made all the important upgrades to the deck, and all the cards that are left are pretty good. Could still fine-tune the deck a little bit here, so if you still have the wild cards, I would suggest maybe adding a second copy of Thorn Lieutenant to make sure that you've got more 2-drops. So this way we've got a total of 8 2-drops, which makes your Pelt Collector grow more consistently if you play a turn 1 Pelt Collector. So we've got 8 2-drops now, and now we need to make one cut, which is going to be pretty difficult here. 
So one of the cards we could consider cutting is the Gore Claw. Could also consider cutting Aggressive Mammoth to lower our curve a little bit. Uh, so I think it's between those two. And in this instance, I'm just going to cut the Gore Claw. And a three toughness creature is also pretty vulnerable to Lightning Strike effects, which are pretty popular out of all the red decks. So yeah, that covers most of the important changes to the deck. Another potential card you can experiment with is Beast Whisper. I've been pretty happy with one or two copies of Beast Whisper in these types of mono green creature decks, since of course your entire deck is creatures, so whenever you play a creature, you get to draw a card, which is pretty nice, giving you a bit of extra card draw in the grindier games. So you could potentially add one or two Beast Whispers, cutting maybe the Aggressive Mammoth or Gigantosaurus, could potentially add a second Gigantosaurus if you're encountering a lot of red decks. Gigantosaurus shines in that matchup since the mono red deck has a very hard time dealing with a Gigantosaurus. So yeah, lots of uh, potential cards you could still experiment with. But for the purposes of this upgrade guide, I'm gonna stop here with upgrading the main deck so we don't have to use any more wild cards. Then going over the sideboard, we've already mentioned Plummet being a pretty nice sideboard card that we can bring in against, for example, the mono blue flyer deck that has a lot of annoying creatures that we want to deal with, and Plummet can do so on the cheap, even though it's a bit of a nombo with our Nullhide Ferox, of course, even if we have to pay the two extra mana if we happen to have a Ferox in play, it's not the end of the world. So Plummet is still a valuable sideboard card there. And then another powerful sideboard card is Vivian Reed, also a bit of a nombo with a Ferox, but it is a very powerful card as it can be brought in against control matchups, drawing us extra cards with the plus one ability, but the minus three is also a versatile answer to both flying creatures, artifacts, and enchantments. And of course, the ultimate ability is also game winning. So one or two copies of Vivian Reed in the sideboard, also pretty nice. And then other good cards against control decks include Sorcerer's Spyglass, since this can help you shut down planeswalkers like the Fairy, but also activated abilities from cards like Ascanta, the Sunken Ruin, so Spyglass can shine in the control matchup. More copies of Vinemare against control decks also help, being a hexproof creature that's very difficult for the opponent to deal with. Not as good against, for example, the Jeskai control deck, since uh, it has access to the Deafening Clarion, dealing 3 damage to all your creatures, which still kills Vinemare. And it also dies to, of course, cards like Settle the Wreckage or Cleansing Nova. But against uh, black control decks, Vinemare really shines since then the second ability can also come up. And another card that's very nice against control decks is Shaper Sanctuary, a one-man enchantment that if you can get down early, whenever the opponent tries to kill one of your creatures, you'll get to draw a card, so it'll replace the creature that's just killed. So then you just have to watch out for sweeper effects since only spot removal will draw you the extra cards. So just as long as you don't overextend, Shaper Sanctuary can easily win you games against control decks that are trying to kill your creatures one by one. So we could add two copies of Shaper Sanctuary, for example. Then I mentioned earlier that we could add another copy of Carnage Tyrant to the sideboard as well for the control matchups. Then another interesting addition is Death Court Scavenger, since it can be used as both graveyard hate but also as a way to gain some life against the more aggressive decks. So we could add two scavengers. And finally a card that shines against the red aggro decks and some of the token decks is Ribjar Raptor, 4 mana for a 4-5 with Enrage. So whenever Ribjar Raptor is dealt damage you get to draw a card. So it's very difficult for the red decks to get past the Ribjar Raptor and if they try and kill it with burn spells you'll get to draw a ton of cards. And against token decks if they want to attack with all their tokens you'll get to block one of them with the Raptor and draw a card. So that's a way to get ahead on cards as well. So two copies of Ritual Raptor could be very nice as well. And then one final suggestion to maybe further upgrade the deck is to splash black by adding some green-black dual lands to the deck. You could get access to Assassin's Trophy, which is a pretty versatile removal spell that can deal with any permanent. And you could also add a sweeper effect like Find Finality, which can be quite strong against, for example, small creature decks or token decks giving you access to a powerful sweeper at 6 mana, and the find part is also useful getting back creatures from the graveyard. So that's an option if you want to add a little bit of black to the deck, but that would require quite a few wild cards since you need all those rare dual lands, so I don't recommend it if you're low on wild cards. Alright, so that's gonna do it for Forest Smite version 2, so now it's time to jump into some games and see how the deck does. Alright, we're on the draw. And this hand seems pretty good. We've got a turn one Pelt Collector, turn two Thorn Lieutenant, turn three Steel Leaf Champion, which will help grow the Pelt Collector even more. Let's see what we're up against. All right, looks like a red deck, which is a good sign since Thorn Lieutenant's pretty good against the red decks and so is Steel Leaf Champion. So they've got a turn one Firebrand, which is gonna be able to kill the Pelt Collector, sadly, but we're still gonna play turn one here. All right, Brontodon's not bad either. 
So Brontodon can be a potential answer to an experimental frenzy that the opponent plays, which is one of the scarier cards. So second Firebrand's gonna shoot down Pelt Collector, and they're gonna get in for one. But Thor Lieutenant is gonna be able to stop the Firebrand in its tracks here. Yeah, generally speaking, the mono red matchup favors the mono green deck, just because your creatures are all bigger and you're able to deal more damage quickly enough where the burn spells won't be able to kill you before you kill them with damage. But of course, a great draw from the red deck and a poor draw from the green deck can make a, a difference. If the opponent has something like a rekindling phoenix, that's also a card that can change the texture of the game. Risk factor can deal 4 to us, we can still afford 4 to here. And our opponent has to say go. Alright, so let's start by attacking with Thorn Lieutenants. I expect our opponent to just take two here. Although they might try and block with the Firebrand and then tap it to shoot us for one in the face. But they are probably better off waiting in case we play a larger creature they can block and then do the same trick. So here we can play Brontodon, we can play Steel Leaf. Steel Leaf pressures the opponent more. But if your opponent has Lightning Strike and then combines it with one damage from Firebrand, they could take out Steel Leaf, which would be unfortunate. So I think I'm actually going to lead with the Brontodon in this instance. Just because of uh, the concern of a Lightning Strike. So we're going to try and bait out the Lightning Strike first if our opponent has it by playing the Brontodon. Next turn we can either play Steel Leaf or we can go Branch Walker plus Thorn Lieutenant. And yep, there's a Wizard's Lining dealing 3 damage to Brontodon. Kind of the same as a, a Lining Strike here. And then Firebrand takes out Brontodon. So that worked out. We get to untap. And I think I prefer playing a Steel Leaf here. Even though it's less mana efficient, it adds more guaranteed power to the board. So we'll get in for 2, play Steel Leaf. And there you could see the opponent already had to 2 for 1 themselves using Lightning and a Firebrand to get rid of one of our creatures that only costs us 3 mana. So, pretty bad trade for the opponent. Goblin Chain is fine. Not a reason not to want to play Branch Walker there potentially. And yeah, Galta's gonna be pretty sweet here. So we can play one of our two drops and then still drop Galta. I think I'll drop uh, Thorn Lieutenant. That way if we draw land number 6 they can both potentially be activated. And then we'll play a 3 mana Galta. And Galta usually ends games pretty quickly against the red decks. Steel Leaf can still attack. Opponent could block and then shock the Steel Leaf. Uh, using First Strike, of course, to take out the Steel Leaf without losing Chain Whirler. Which is why we wanted to play Galta before attacking to make sure we still had our 5 power Steel Leaf in play. But I have a hard time imagining our opponent coming back once we deploy Galta here. So we're down to 11. The fact that our opponent aggressively killed our Brontodon could also mean that they have an experimental frenzy in hand that they wanted to protect. But we're definitely going to kill the opponent before it's going to matter. Here we're seeing Aggressive Mammoth, not the best card in the deck at 6 mana, it is pretty pricey. Here you can kind of see why Galta is so great, since it can come down with only 2 or 3 mana. So yeah, let's just attack with everyone. And our opponent is most likely just dead here. Alright, Lightning Strike plus Chain Whirler block on Champion, but then they're still taking 12 Trample from Galta and 2 from the Lieutenants, so that's not going to be enough. Alright, sweet, on to the next one. Alright, we're on the draw and we've got another reasonable opening hand. Turn 1 Pelt Collector, turn 2 Harpooner. We're missing a 3-drop, but we've got a turn 4 Vinemare. Again, Aggressive Mammoth is probably the first card I would cut if we were to make another addition to the deck, like maybe another Thorn Lieutenant or a Beast Whisper. And we're kind of seeing it in uh, two games now where 6 mana is pretty steep for Aggressive Mammoth. But of course, when we do get to play it and have some large creatures in play, the effect that we get is uh, very nice. Alright, perfect. Steel Leaf Champion means we get a nice 1, 2, 3, 4 curve. Nothing to fight with a Crawl Harpooner here. Let's get in for two. And looks like we might be up against some sort of token stack with Shana growing the more creatures the opponent has in play. And a Sapling Migration is a nice follow-up. 
definitely blocking Shana should it attack, but it's gonna stay back. Gigantosaurus is nice, although not great against a bunch of tokens, unless we can give a trample with Mammoth. So we're just gonna play a Steel Leaf to grow Pelt Collector one more. And then I'm totally fine attacking with both here. I'm guessing our opponent's gonna block Pelt Collector with Shanna, unless they're planning to make a bunch more tokens next turn, which seems to be the case. But then we can drop Fine Mare, Pelt Collector's gonna be a 4 4. We'll see what happens. Opponent's already down to 12, we're still at 20. Alright, it's gonna be a March of the Multitudes, main phase, making 4 life linking tokens, but uh, Steel Leaf Champion can ignore those. So I think main phase we're just gonna play a Vine Mare, make Belt Collector into a 4-4. The only question here is whether we attack with a Harpooner or not, since our opponent can easily just block with two tokens. But I think I'm still fine attacking with the Harpooner, since the fewer tokens our opponent has, the less they can convoke a second March of the Multitudes. So we'll just send with everyone. And yeah, Belt Collector does have Trample once it gets the third counter, so our opponent might have missed that. So our opponent is down to 2. And yeah, let's see how much damage your opponent can do. They don't have enough mana for Flower Flourish, but they could have the uh, 2 mana Ascent give their creatures plus 2 plus 2. So that's 9 plus another 6 is 15, plus another 8 would be 23. So if we block 1-1 one, one, one token, that would not be enough. So we might be forced to block Shana here since they do have just enough for the City's Blessing here. And I think we can afford to uh, play around it here, since it would be pretty silly to just die otherwise. And then Pelt Collector still grows from the Vine Mare dying, so it's not the end of the world. Yeah, I think I go for it. And yep, Pride of Conquerors, that's what we played around here. Opponent did gain a ton of life, but at least we're not dead yet. And now the Crackback should be lethal. All right, sweet. So managed to beat the green-white tokens. Made sure to play around the Pride of Conquerors near the end there, otherwise we could have died, which is pretty scary. But on to the next one. All right, we're on the draw. This hand's not great since uh, we've got triple four drop in hand. No early plays besides Pelt Collector. So I think we're mulliganing this one. Alright, can't really keep a no-lander, even though we are on the draw and we get a scry. With a land on top, the sand would be reasonable. Got to play a turn one lander elves, turn two lander elves into pelt collector. Definitely very sketchy, although are we gonna win on a mold to five? I don't think so, so yeah, let's just keep this. Bottle lander elves. And our opponent on what looks like a blue-white, maybe control deck. And luckily we hit the land. Alright, let's see if we can uh, draw out of it. And we drew the land, so we could play turn to Steel Leaf, but I think I'm gonna play around Assassin's Scatter Syncopate here. And instead uh, just go Pelt Collector into Thorn Lieutenants, which is still a pretty reasonable play. But plays around a uh, Counterspell better. Alright, looks like our opponent didn't have it after all. Still got to add 4 power to the board, next turn Steely for Brontodon can grow Pelt Collector one more. So I'm still fine with it. So against blue-white control, the major concern of course are the sweeper effects. Don't want to overextend if we can avoid it. Which I think means... We're just gonna play one more Brontodon here as our last threat. I'll do it main phase if they counter it. That might give us some more info as well. Alright, they do sabotage it. Doesn't mean that they don't have a sweeper in hand necessarily, but... If our opponent did have something like a Cleansing Nova, then they might have been tempted to let it resolve instead. We'll see. So our opponent's got 4 mana. Opponent passes a turn. So here I don't think I want to play Steel Leaf to grow Pelt Collector, otherwise if they do have Cleansing Nova, we've got nothing left. So we just have to keep uh, Settler Rankage in mind here. If our opponent goes Settle the Rackage, we can play Steel Leaf at least. 
but uh, if our opponent then goes to Fairy Minus, we're in trouble. So we could attack with just the two power creatures. Our opponent's still going to be tempted to settle, but then we can at least play Steel Leaf and still have Lander Elves to pressure to Fairy if they minus. Don't hate it. But at the same time, we still make them use the settle if they have it. So let's get two lands. So the question now is, do we play Steel Leaf and Lander Elves, or just Lander Elves? I guess we still play both here. Say go. And you have to have a Cleansing Nova, we're probably dead. But at least now we can pressure Teferi. I'm known for my we need so our opponent's gonna plus. If they have a seal away, we're in trouble. I think we sent everyone at the ferry, since if they have a seal away, I would rather deal two damage to the ferry than two damage to the opponent. And instead, it's a blink of an eye, not as bad as a seal away. And yeah, we're not beating a cleansing nova at this point, so we just have to commit. And then uh, we'll see if we can play around the Settler Rankage or not. Keep up the pace. A Knight of Grace, that's fine. Second Knight of Grace, interesting. So now they've got two pretty decent blockers, although they still can't block the Steel Leaf Champion. So I think the plan is just attack the Fairy with Steel Leaf. Hope it works. Alright. So your opponent's down to having two cards in hand. And yeah, I'll play my land, I guess. Say go. So Knight of Grace main deck might be a concession to some of the aggro decks out there. Main phase Chemister's Insights. It's not what we wanted to see, since now our opponent can refuel, maybe find more removal, more Teferis. Can only attack for five here, because Knight of Grace has first strike, so Harpooner would not be able to attack profitably. And yeah, we keep drawing lands. I guess we still play one. In case we need to hard cast a Galt at some point. And it's gonna be a Lara Dawnbringer. Yep, yeah, Lara's hard to beat, unless we have another Harpooner. But there's not even that many creatures in our graveyard. Another Brontodon's not gonna do it. So our best hope now is to find one of our very large green creatures, or another Kral Harpooner. Let's pass a turn. Alright, opponent's not attacking. Showing a lot of respect. Let's uh, play Lieutenant, which can potentially become pretty large. We can pay for Syncopate for 7 here. Alright, nothing from the opponent. I think I'll keep land in hand just to represent having something left, but could be correct to just play the land in case we draw two lands in a row and want to activate Lieutenant twice. Opponent with another Chemist's Insight discards Syncopate, so opponent was counting whether they could counter the Lieutenant there. But I don't love our position. Alright, we untap. Well, there's Galta. Galta's decent. Unlikely to work here with their opponent having four cards in hand. So opponent can sink a point for X equals uh, eight here, which means we do want to play the land first. And Galta resolves. All right, that's good. Still can't attack with Lieutenant since if our opponent triple blocks with their first rank creatures, the Lieutenant will still die without doing anything. Opponent's attacking with everyone, so this indicates that they've got a Cleansing Nova incoming and they just want to get some damage in before wiping the board. So that's not good for us. On the bright side, we get rid of uh, Lyra, but uh, it comes at a cost. So might as well block there too. And then we still get to pump Lieutenants. Yep, there's a Cleansing Nova. And now it's four cards from the opponent versus 
I saw nothing. Fine, Mare's okay. And yeah, opponent was sandbagging the Essence Scatter, so when we played Galta, they probably had it in hand. But since they were on the Cleansing Nova plan, they were okay with it. And now a Hisra Banalia. So our opponent actually has a lot more creatures than we originally thought, which makes the presence of all the sweeper effects pretty interesting. Brontodon could destroy history, but Brontodon also just blocks the night tokens. We will take a pretty big hit from the third chapter, but afterwards the Brontodon can block, so I think it's worth it to keep it on defense. And our opponent's also top decking at this point, so despite uh, our opponent resolving multiple sweepers, we're still in the game. So our opponent gets to hit us for 12, down to 6. But then Brontodon will be a reasonable blocker. And we're just looking for big creatures at this point. Another chemist is inside, so your opponent has drawn six or eight extra cards. So it's difficult to overcome all the card advantage, so this would be a matchup where having, for example, a Beast Whisperer could definitely help. And all the sideboard cards I mentioned, like more Carnage Tyrants, Sorcerer Spyglass to shut down the Fairy, Vivian to draw cards. Another Camister's Insights. And we're drawing the Lenore Elves portion of our deck, which isn't very exciting here. A Steel Leaf Champion would be pretty interesting here. Instead, another Crawl Harpooner. Don't even think we play it since it can't attack into the Knight of Grace anyway. And we might want to keep it in case of a second Lara Dawnbringer. So I'm guessing our opponent has something like a Zelda Rankage in hand by now. They might just Assa Scatter or counter the champion somehow. And yep, it's going to be Assa Scatter. And at this point both players have so much mana that Trying to hold threats to try and play them in the same turn is not really going to work out. Alright, if we keep top decking Sea Leaf Champions and our opponent runs out of counter spells, then we might have a chance. But they probably have another Zelda Rankage or some other removal spell like Seal Away in hand. But Steel Leaf can attack past the Night Tokens at least. And it's going to be Seal Away, which we can destroy with the Brontodon. So I don't mind doing that. And by doing it in response, Steel Leaf Champion never leaves the battlefield, so it's still attacking. Do they have another one? Nope, they have a Zelda Rankage as well. Yep. Alright, well. We're in a bit of trouble now. Still don't think I want to play out a Harpooner, even though it blocks... The token's pretty well, maybe we just have to run it out at this point. Since uh, next turn opponent gets to attack with everyone potentially, we can put Branchwalker and the uh, Lateral Elves in front of the Knight tokens, we'll take two from Knight of Grace. Which is not great, if we just play Harpooner we can double block the Knight of Grace. They only get to kill one of our two creatures. And then it's much easier to deal with the Knight tokens themselves. So I think we do play Harpooner. Even though we might regret it if her opponent drops a second angel. And her opponent is attacking with everyone. So I will go for the double blocks. Opponent gets to kill Harpooner with Knight of Grace. Still have our Branch Walker to trade for the other Knight token next turn. All 
All right, not a Brontodon helps. So I don't even mind attacking with a Branch Walker here. I guess I should have tried to see if Brontodon resolves, but I don't think they're holding any more counter spells at this point. Can't play around Syncopate at this point. Let's just say go. And an Allhide Ferox is pretty spicy. So let's attack with both. Not a subtle. Put him down to eight. Let's hope this works. They might also be holding another Cleansing Nova. In which case playing the Nullhide could be a mistake. But it's difficult to know for sure. Alright, so we could put them to the test attack with everyone. They could easily be holding another cell to wreckage, in which case attacking with everyone would not be ideal. I think we attack with Ferox and Branchwalker here. Split the difference. Alright, another subtle. Play a branch walker now. Hope to find more action. That counts. Alright, let's send both. Our opponent did find another syncopate for 12. That'll work. All right, well, we've got a two-turn clock with a Brontodon. Hopefully, opponent just draws some more lands. Well, that's a land, but it's a memorial, so that's going to give them two extra draws next turn. All right, opponent down to two. Let's see if we can uh, get there. Don't have high hopes after the memorial. And a Chemist's Insight can let them draw four cards. So they'll likely find another answer. All their opponent is down to 15 cards in library, so who knows. And yep, another Teferi. That's gonna be the nail in the coffin here. So our best hope now is that our opponent just doesn't have any win conditions remaining in their deck, and they just end up decking themselves before they can reach ultimate with Teferi. Search for Ascanto's Gun Transform, so opponent's going to have all the spells they possibly want out of the remaining deck. But they just put another Knight of Grace in the graveyard, so who knows what uh, win conditions they have left. Since I don't think the Fairy is going to reach ultimate before they deck themselves. Alright, well, History of Banalia could definitely kill us now. Do they have another one? Sell the wreckage, number four. And there's a Nullhide Ferox, which is probably going to get countered. Yep. Next turn we'll draw Brontodon. But then we'll die to the History of Banalia third chapter here, so we are dead. Alright, well, we gave it a shot. Got our opponent to eight cards in library. And yeah, this is a pretty horrible matchup, if you couldn't tell. So this is why most of our sideboard cards are dedicated to beating control decks. Let's play Brontodon. And see if they've got any counter spells left over in hand. They do. And yep, that will do it. Alright, GG's opponents. Pretty long game. And we'll let them deal the finishing blow here with his Banalia. All right. So 
So on the bright side, we got to show off the deck against various archetypes, against Monored, which is a favorable matchup, against Tokens, which is a pretty even matchup, but we got a pretty decent draw and played around the one trick we needed to remember. And uh, then Blue-White Control, which is a pretty bad matchup, but we still give our opponent a run for their money. So yeah, that's gonna do it for this upgrade guide. I hope you enjoyed. Feel free to let me know in the comments which deck we should upgrade next. But for now, I wanna thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.